built very strong backlogs, um, uh, you know, which which we then use to 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 improve our products. So before I jump into into all of this, as I already said, my name is Luke. I'm a product manager at Hodger. I've been working at Hodger for two years. Um, I'm currently take, I'm currently looking at to, looking after um, monetization of the products. Um, I, I'm based in Malta, uh, in the Mediterranean. So uh, I also love to travel when I can. Uh, not this time, definitely. Um, I'm, uh, and uh, as a hobby, uh, as hobbies, I like to um, watch birds. Uh, that may sound boring to a lot of you, but it's actually a thing. And photography as well, wildlife for photography. And recently, I've been um, quite a lot into DIY hobby, hobby stuff. I'm sort of working on 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 building our house. So yeah, that's um, that's what I like to do in my free time. I also run a, a blog when I have time. It's called Short Curly Products. So feel free to visit it, visit it if you want, um, if you're interested. And I generally love to chat with different people working in products um, in different companies. So if you want to um, ping me, um, if you want to have uh, a chat, feel free to ping me. LinkedIn is probably the best, um, the best source. But yeah, just even if you have any feedback after this call, that would be. That would be great. I'd love to hear it. So let's go back to uh, what I was saying before, right? Um, uh, building a very strong backlog. So this is how I like to to um, to think about um, building backlogs and and the, the whole uh, discovery process that we go through. Is I think the objective for us is um, from a universe of possibilities like the, we can improve our product in different ways in hundreds thousands if not millions of different ways there are millions of different iterations we can do different uh, different things that we can work on so the way i like to think about it is that from this universe of possibilities what we really need to be focusing in on is how do we find that next best thing that we can do for our products Something that I, I also like to like to um, uh, talk about with the squad is like um, yes we we are uh, in our roles the product managers we sort of uh, actually if you think about it we as product managers we are like a very limited group of people right um, you've got one product for one product manager for a product that probably serves hundreds thousands uh, potentially even millions of of users so. Uh, we 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 can't really we we can't really say that um we we are a, a representative sample of of the users of of our product right so if we, we can definitely not rely on our on just our judgment to improve to improve our product because we are not users and ultimately who makes a product successful it's the users it's the market and as i like to as i like to think about i've got this this my to-do list is in Trello and I've got this background is I always uh, it's always in front of me is your opinion does not matter it's the market's opinion that matters right because the, the users the market is who um, should be guiding what we do in our product now um, obviously this is why we do things like we speak to our users etc and this is gathering all that information all that data um, around how people use their products um, but uh, so the, and this is the crux of it, right? The only way how we can how 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 we can decide on what to build next, the only way how we can do that in a in a wise manner, um, is by looking at is 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 by looking at the data we've got and taking that data and structuring it even more, um, getting more uh, and building building on that data to get to, to enrich it in a way uh, that we can use it to make to take the right decisions. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people have already seen this this pyramid in the past. It's called the DIKW pyramid essentially what it is um uh, it, it, what it, it, the way i like to think about it is wisdom if you if you if you think of wisdom right it's it's about the future it's the wisdom to take the right decisions going forward and you take the right decisions um you you wake you make wise decisions because um you've got 
uh, knowledge of, um, uh, so you, you take these right decisions based on the knowledge that you have of, of, of the product, of how people are using your product, etc. So if you think about it, the, you know, why? Um, and that knowledge is built by, through um, information, that information is built from different data points. Data points are like the facts of the world, right? So as, as a product manager, there are like two, I, I'm gonna focus on two important things um, that's, you know, in the discovery and the delivery process, two things that we really need to nail um, before we can we can start delivering is, uh, and there are like two, two focus areas that I, I, I like to segment. One is that we want to identify what's that next value adding item, as I said. So, and, and, and we do that. Um, to obviously improve the value of the product, so you can really um, see why finding shining star is important. Because the more um, you you improve the value of the product, obviously, the more value, uh, the more value your customers are going to get, the more happy customers you're going to get, and obviously, the better you're performing as a product manager, right? Um, we also want to be continuously on this lookout, so making sure that you have the right data, making sure that we have constantly updated data to make sure that um, we pivot, right? So uh, another a caveat to the um, to, to that thought process that thought process that you know there are like a million different opportunities that you can think about, um, and you need to find uh, the, the the one that delivers the next best value, is that you will probably I would say you will most likely fail to to get the thing that 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 it gives the most value and um, uh, so, well, most of the times it's because it's obviously difficult right very difficult to find so whenever we find something else we need to make sure that um, uh, we, we need to be continuously monitoring this data and continuously remain um, uh, wise about how people are using our product what people want etc um, so that we can pivot as well, right? This is this is agile, right? I'm not explaining anything anything new here, but um, uh, yeah. So th you can really see how how why data is 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 so important. Um, also, as you we are all currently living through like this current situation, you know, like um, uh, get, making sure that you get their up-to-date information um, will also guide you to pivot wisely. Not because you've you've not you've not found like the um, the next best thing for your product, but but also because circumstances change and you might want to pivot because um, the, 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 the universe has changed, the situation overall has changed, right? So let's say, so, so I want to work on the next highest value adding item, but more importantly, once we've identified it, which is we something that's really important, like a characteristic of a strong product manager, I believe, uh, is that um, once that's identified, the next step is to just get on with it and just deliver. And to deliver it, obviously, we're product managers, we're not engineers, so we can't just go in and, and go the things ourselves. But we need to work with a team. We need to we need to we need the buy-in from the team. Um, uh, so that we can, you know, everyone can align and everyone can commit to the same thing. So we um, we, we we have less time, we 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 less uh, we waste less time, and we spend more time actually improving the products. So uh, and I, maybe just I just want to walk through very from a very high level because uh, it's it's only fifteen minutes, so I don't want to take too much time. And um, from very high level, this is how. I generally go around working on finding the next highest value um, adding item to our product, right? So um, uh, you can see this timeline here. First, start off. Um, so if, if you go back to, to the pyramid I, 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 ex I explained here, if especially if you're still new to the organization, especially if you're still new to the industry that you're operating in, especially if 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 maybe to, to you to your to the pairs that you're that you're serving um you 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 might want to start from the bottom um wisdom is built on top of data so you need to make sure to to make these right decisions you need to make sure that you're focusing 
on getting that bottom layer, the foundation, really correct. So, um, uh, so the, the the first steps in finding the next um, uh, value, you know, biggest value adding item uh, that that you can implement in your product is to actually take a step back and look at like what and just ask ourselves what are the different opportunity areas. And I'm, here I'm talking about high level stuff right so if you in in my area if we're talking about monetization it's about thinking like do we have the the what are like what could we do to um to 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 increase more monetization is it upselling is it um uh, aligning our, our 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 prices with what the with what the market willingness to pay is is it changing our packaging and for each of these areas you start digging into the data that you have around these areas. So um, you look at usage patterns, you, you look at, the, at the, the basically at, at, uh, at all the data that you have around your customers, how they use the product, um, et cetera. Uh, and so what you, you're trying to, 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 to build here is find, first you find that those, those those rules, those those facts, um, which is the data, and um, use those facts to build to start building some form of, you know, information um, around uh, around the different opportunities that you highlighted, and um, you take this, and when you take this, um, uh, the, the next step is so you've got these high high level opportunities, and you know what are the opportunities here. Um, uh, once immediately you'll start getting a feel of you know whether this this is maybe like the the opportune moment to um to to focus on this on this area does it align with strategy is that the first you know data that that i've gathered is it looking good um uh, and for the ones that um you, you, where you see that actually there is potential, um, we need to dig a bit more data, and we and this is when we start focusing more on gathering the data that we need, and that may be the um, qualitative data, uh, uh, translating it to quantitative data maybe, getting the quantitative data from tools that you might have. So um, I've listed some tools there, some mixed panel, you look at the funnels, how people are using your site, Google Analytics, maybe optimizedly looking at at, uh, at previous experiments that, that, that were run, basically building this data and trying to connect the dots and actually translating that data into knowledge. Um, knowledge, which we then can use um, to take uh, the, the, the 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 wise decision, sort of, to, you know, to, to find the opportunity area, and at this stage, we also want to to think about um, uh, costs, right? So, how, how much will this cost us? Again, um, at this stage, we're just looking at opportunities. You want to get the data really right um, when it comes to cost. It, with the data, you're going to to or you already going to get some uh, idea of how much this is, how much you can spend on this. So you can immediately get an idea of 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 how much cost you can incur um, to to to, to um, tackle this opportunity area. And with this data, with 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 uh, with with all this information, with all this knowledge that you now have around like the, the, these high level opportunities, um, you can immediately identify the top three opportunities. Um, do just a bit of a um, uh, cost benefit analysis. Uh, I come from from an economics background, so I I, I use I, I like to use um, uh, things measures that like net present value. You can there are things like um, the return on investment rates. There are multiple ways how you can evaluate the different opportunities that you have, um, uh, and uh, you know like take a Google sheet and basically. Um, take the different opportunities uh, and say, and I would normally say, okay, what if, what's the, what's the optimistic um, uh, target that maybe we can, we, we can, what's the optimistic number we can target, what's the pessimistic number, and with these you can start evaluating your opportunity. So with all this exercise, essentially what you're doing is building a business case. And if you think about it, um, uh, you build the, the reasons why business cases are built is not for, you know, not for just purchasing tools, etc. But you need to start thinking about uh, building 
the next features that to add in your product, uh, the next problems rather than, than features actually to, to solve in your products as uh, as a whole business case, right? You need to be you need to start building that proof that actually you know this is what this is something that we are fairly certain will add value to the product, and you can see you can see how this ties in into data driven product manage, product management because obviously you can't build a business case on loose data on on weak data you need to really have um uh, that, uh, that that strong uh, data that's uh, to, to back your arguments because the next step after building a business case is going to be getting the buy-in from your director from your exec and also from your teams on why this is an opportunity that you should actually be working on so if if you think about it, if you think about buy-in now, so um, uh, using the, this 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 information, this business case that you've built um, to convince people that this is the right thing to invest, this is the next best thing to invest in your product, um, uh, you can you you can sort of think of this business case as being this piece of wisdom, knowing what you know that's going to tell people that this is the next best thing to invest in and this is the wise thing to do the first thing people are going to question is um but why so why is this you know why do you think um uh, this is the next best thing to invest in and this is because and and you can answer that question because um, you you've gathered the data you've 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 connected that data together and you you have found a reason um, uh, you, you've th there is like you've built a whole story around it and you found the reason why this will work so this is where knowledge comes in you can with knowledge yeah, you can ex you can explain um, why we should take this decision but obviously like um going down the pyramid um knowledge um you know you can explain to people why uh, we, we we're doing this but obviously for people who people who are curious and obviously people who need to make sure that this is actually the right decision um are going to also ask but how do we know that right and this is information so like whereas with the previous process we are going up we are building data to build you know to and gathering it together to get information to um to get up to wisdom to get buy-in you will you will see that you will start actually going down this pyramid people asking why we're doing it but how how do we know that so how do we know that is what's happening and finally the next step is based off what evidence so i think keeping this pyramid in mind re really really helps when 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 you're uh, in, in that discovery process trying to find the next best thing to work on and trying to get the buy-in um, and i find it really useful so I, I hope this is also helpful for you. And I'll just focus finally a bit on 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 the buy-in piece. Um, I, I really like to. Um, so one, I, there, there is this framework. Um, it's it's it's. I, I attended a conference, Mind the Product, in, in in 2018 in London, where this talk really struck me. It was by Janice Fraser at the time. She was the CPO at Bionic, and um, she had this framework called UBAD. Uh, where which explains which, which is like a framework which explains like what you need to focus on to get buy-in from people and the number one thing is that you need to make sure people understand why you're doing it right and again taking you back to the to, to going down the pyramid that's it this is what you're doing and with that understanding um uh, you you can explain why you believe that this will be that this uh, that you know that you believe that this is the next best thing and um, once you once you um, uh, once people are also believing what you what you're telling them because obviously they understand it um, they can then start advocating and if you know and that's that is where you get buy-in and and people will eventually start taking decisions aligned with the decisions that you would have taken so um, this is like some 
a framework that I thought I'd share, which is really helpful for me, uh, if you think about it. So just to make sure, you first need to get to make sure that the people get under un understanding the same things that you understand, that they also believe in 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 the same way that that you do and then they can start advocating for you and taking decisions aligned with um with with, with your business case with your whatever you're doing um and really and truly as you can see if if you build that strong business case if you build those strong foundations you can actually end up in a point at a point where people are doing the work for you and people are advocating for you and you know it's it's making your job a bit easier um essentially so yeah that was my presentation on why i believe data-driven product management is really important um, to 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 make to to build the right things not just to 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 find the right things and um, to, to find the right things and, and to start delivering on them, but also to actually get the buy-in you need from exec, but and also from your squad, so you can focus on delivering um, value as early as possible to your customers. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions, Mirella? Thanks, Luke. Uh... So far, we we would all see them in the Q and A. Uh, so the Q and A, I don't see any. Um, question to the participants: Can you guys enter uh, your question there? If not, uh, you can reply on the chat. All right. So we have one. Test. Thanks, Matas. Okay. So then uh, this works. Cool, so we have a question from Cesar. So uh, one advocacy process, you mean like an example of um, where people started advocating for, 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 for a decision, for example? Yes, okay. So, Yes, actually. So, um, uh, so I, I can give a very practical example, right? Um, uh, last year, um, or beginning yeah, last year, getting confused. Um, uh, last year, we had a, we, I, I was going through this process again, and uh, one of the high level op area op of opportunities that um, I had identified sort of like at the very beginning was um, uh, improving the, the uptake of yearly plans. Right, so um, obviously I'm I'm working from a monetization point of view. Um, so I did some some math again, like the opportunities. How many customers um, do we have? What if we increase the number of of yearly plans um, from currently around like ten percent to say twenty percent or fifteen percent? Um, what what would that be? And you know, it was a very strong business case, right? And uh, when you if you build a business case i found that if you build a business case and translate um, the values into uh, into monetary benefits um, this is why i use npv um, it, it, it's a very simple con con um, con uh, concept by the way if you look it up it, it should be fairly easy to understand but because it was you know essentially the the, the bottom line was like if if we manage to to get this, um, uh, you're gonna get one two million euros in revenue additional um, every year that we're currently not getting. Um, apart from that, you would get like an increase in, in in the retention of customers because we also found that yearly customers stay with us for longer even post the um, the year. So uh, yeah, it was a strong business case, right? And um, uh, Basically, at that point, as soon as I as I put uh, as I put that business case in in front of 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 the VP of product and engineering at the time, um, obviously he was started off being skeptical, asking, "But mm, are you sure did we get the right data? Mm -hmm, okay, this makes sense." As soon as he understood it, then um, uh, yearly became a priority from an exec level down. 
you know so uh, it, it was it, that was a very clear example of of um, uh, of like an advocacy process where you, the, the director is ending ended up exec ended up advocating for something that um, uh, for, for a business case that that i had worked on um yeah hope that hope that helps cool so do we have another question um shall we take it uh, it's yes, around it's anonymous. Cool. Um, how did you go about estimated market size for the concept or opportunity? Uh, I think at so the earlier out that you are, the the less accurate it's going to be. So uh, this is why I like um, to think about uh, sizing opportunity, having like different sizes of of, of the same opportunity. Like, what what if uh, what would happen if there was a you know this is a, a, a good case scenario? What if it's more pessimistic? Um, I think that helps you gauge sort of um, you know if, if, if is this. Yeah, it helps you gauge basically. It becomes even, you know, um, it, it will become sort of like on its own. It will show you of whether you should be taking that risk basically. Um, in terms of, so just to take on this example, um, uh, just to take on the, the example of the early, what I had done was I uh, I spoke to a few um, uh, to a few other product managers, a few other, um, you know, working at other companies. People, SaaS, SaaS companies um, uh, selling selling online like we do, and I sort of asked them, listen, um, have, what what are what levels do you see here? You know, thankfully, I've, um, I, I'm I'm very open and I I can also provide that that information, and and they did the same. So I sort of said, okay, like if um, if the average is like 20%, then we're prob there's probably something that we can do. So in, in that case, I said, okay, I'm going to target 15%, a more conservative figure. So I think getting that information from other sources is, is key. It, this is a bit different for each particular scenario right this is yearly we're talking about if you're talking about a new product uh, if you especially if you like a new market it may be a bit more difficult um, but you have to be creative uh, on how you do things but what I would what I would say what I saw in the past that really helped getting like that total addressable market to a correct figure is to really focus on who are your customers or who are you targeting like be very 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 specific and try to get the number of those people out there that that are available to you uh, i think that was an exercise when we are looking at our total addressable market in the beginning um it was you know like the very first Back of the napkin calculations, um, uh, the numbers seemed too big, too, too good to be true. Uh, in fact, they were. And what we ended up doing was literally like a, put, um, did an exercise, identify our ideal customers, and said, right, this is how we're gonna target, uh, how we're gonna size our market by focusing on our ideal customers. Okay. Thank you. Um, and for the does the opportunity cost be at what point does the opportunity cost become unviable? Um, so um, uh, so the the cost of the well, I I would say the point where the cost of an opportunity does does no longer make sense is like one one example is when it deviates away from strategy so with this in mind it is very very important that there is a good a solid product a vision for the product where we want to take the product in in the next two to five years so obviously you're working sort of in alignment with that north star vision if there is no strong vision for the product there's no idea of you know strategy of how, of where we're taking the product of the customers who the product is targeting um in the, or who we want to start targeting in two to five years i would say take a step back and make sure that um you i say you right in, in plural and uh, that, that that this 
that, that this vision, this strategy is built because you can, as I said, there are a million different ways of improving your product and you can make a really big mistake um, if you don't have like a vision for your product, um, if, if product managers or like people in the organization start finding opportunities to pivot the product in a way that you don't expect it to pivot or you don't want it to pivot. So I'd say that is um, uh, number one. Number two, what always keep in, keeping in mind, but this is obviously at a higher company strategy level, that what you what you are building the opportunity that you're looking at um that that it is scalable right um uh, is it uh, it's scalable and it's sustainable like um uh, it would be it, it might it, let's say let's say for example the early case i'll take the early case as another example if we see that for example um yearly uh, actually improved the, the the revenue that we get out of our customers but it, it resulted that after 12 months everyone turned and you know people are using the product for nine months out of out of the 12 and you know that's quite short termist so even though you get like a really good opportunity it does not keep the health of the of of the product in mind and you probably should avoid these things so I would say those those two things: sustainability, scalability, and making sure it aligns with strategy. Cool. So I think. So um, does someone else want to pose questions? Can maybe wait another minute. Going once, going twice. And it is as an auction now. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mirella, for the opportunity again. And thank you very much, everyone, for listening in. Thank you so much. Look, it was great. And um, next up, we have uh, Lawrence uh, Van Veel from uh, Talon One, uh, which is a Berlin based company. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I keep getting pop ups uh, from Zoom that my internet connection is unstable. One of the downsides of living in Berlin and everyone doing home office at the same time and not having fiber internet or anything. Uh, but yeah, let's hope this goes well. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen. All right, can you confirm that you see a full screen slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, so um, Luke uh, made a few good points and like uh, pointing out that like, yes, collecting data is very important, uh, like to make your business case or to be like confident uh, that the features you're developing are the right ones and are worth developing. Uh, I would like to talk a bit more about how how to collect data because collecting data can be quite hard actually and challenging. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this is going to be more about like what we as a company tried out, like to get user feedback, to get like useful statistics. And this is like more about like, we tried these things out. They worked well for us. I'm not going to be like trying to advocate that what we did is like what should work for everybody. But I just hope that like sharing what worked well for us can inspire you guys and like help you like maybe. Uh, if you're struggling with similar issues and in, in terms of like how to get uh, good feedback out of your customers. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll have to start with explaining what Talent One is. Uh, after that, I'll explain who our users are, uh, then how we collect feedback from them. And then uh, uh, some examples of changes that we implement based on feedback we collected. Uh, the last point is actually an error in my slide, uh, which I forget to correct. Sorry for that. Yeah, so first of all, so Talent One is like a B2B software as a service solution, uh, just like Hotjar is in that sense. Uh, but we are trying to offer promotions as a service, um, meaning that 
any type of business that sells stuff online could be a potential customer of Talent One, insofar that as soon as you're selling stuff, you're probably you want to run, you're gonna to want to run promotions, like either time-based promotions or just you want to have vouchers or stuff like that. So Talent One aims to take over all of this functionality. So basically, you connect your web shop to our platform whenever. Uh, you configure then in our UI all the different promotions you want to run. Uh, then at runtime, whenever a customer places an order, your web shop is going to send a message to Talent One saying, hey, this customer is currently buying these products. And Talent One, the platform, will respond with a message saying, okay, this specific order by this specific customer uh, should trigger like these specific discounts or these like other types of effects in this context. Um, so connecting the shop means that our product is like API based. So basically it's like a REST API that your, uh, that our customers connect to. I, I imagine this is all like very technical for many of you, but I, I try to stay as high level as possible in, in like what are, yeah, like uh, what we do in this context, but basically, yes. Uh, so we offer, to that effect, we like offer developer docs. Uh, we have open source SDKs, and we also have like some third party integrations like Graze or Segment, if you know these tools, basically, uh, we can connect out of the box with those type of, of uh, tools to share data. So that's one part of the pro uh, product, right? Which is like your web shop connecting to our backend um leading to this uh yeah this connection that has to be built basically through the api the other part is the ui where uh people will actually go and configure all these campaigns right let's like say uh you're like selling clothes and you want to run like a spring sale like starting next week uh this has to be configured right like from next week uh for the following two months i want to give a 10 percent discount on all items from the winter collection or something like that. This is like a promotion that needs to be entered and configured somewhere. That's like where our UI comes into play uh, for like people to configure those things. And basically, so it, it's all rule-based. So each campaign will has, has a, you can graphically configure rules saying like, if someone takes a certain action, then a certain reward should be triggered. So that's like kind of on a, on a high level what the talent one product is doing uh, so in that context like who are are our users because we're going to have to collect feedback from users but who are our users and i think it's already clear that we have two main categories of users like we have two big personas obviously you can like subdivide into way more granular different user types but on a very high level we have two very big different customers on the one hand you have the developers of our customers that are responsible for integrating the web shop of our customers with Talent One, like they are a big customer to us because the better experience that the developers have in integrating Talent One, the more likely it is that they're going to recommend us. And also, the the lower the cost of integration is because you're going to have to spend like less time on the yeah less time and less resources spent on actually connecting your system to Talent One. And once that phase is over, like once the integration is done, our customer becomes very different because in that phase, then the main customer of Talent One becomes the marketeer that has to like uh, enter, like configure all these campaigns and manage everything on like the day-to-day -day basis. And so, yeah, these are two very different types of users with very different needs. Uh, and we figured out that like, if you have very different types of users, like different personas, you require different strategies for collecting feedback and data for each of these different uh, personas. Um, yeah, so how did we go about that? Like, uh, first of all, let me share some issues that we had trying to gather data in the past. First of all, is that our user base is quite small. Like we target enterprise customers uh, that pay quite a lot of money per month, let's say. So, the, so we have a relatively small pool of customers that uh, spend a relatively big amount of money on talent one um, about 20 like it goes up and down I would say we were on a good track to reach 40 by the end of the year but obviously 
things change as the world changes around us. Uh, on average, each customer has about six users configured. So six people that actually use the tool per customer we have. That leaves us with about 120 users. And since these are like it's B2B, so these are people with day-to-day -day jobs, right? So they, they, whenever we try to reach out for surveys, like most people respond like, oh, sorry, we don't have time for that or, or whatever. And at the same time, like this type of voluntary surveys, after a while you start noticing that it's always the same vocal users that start replying. And I think it doesn't matter if you have 10 customers or if you have 10 million customers, this is something you're gonna see everywhere. Um, it's a specific subset of your customers that are eager to share feedback. But these people might not be representative of your entire user base. So if you rely on only uh, this type of feedback, um, you risk on developing your product for only a certain subset of your users that, that might have very specific needs that are not the same as the needs of your, let's say, your global user base. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, collecting user feedback can be very resource intensive. So any tools that exist to help facilitate this process are, are, are yeah, more than welcome to help. So persona one was like the developer, like how do we try to collect feedback from developers? So first thing we did is at the end of each integration phase, like when our customers announced like, yeah, we're gonna go like live uh, next week with Talent One, like from next week on all our coupon codes are gonna run through Talent One or stuff like that. Uh, at that point, we like reach out to the developers to have like a, a final sync uh, in how how happy they were with the experience of uh, integrating with uh, with talent one and if they like how much effort did it take and what could we have done to make the integration easier stuff like that so that's like the let's say the the hands-on manual approach of collecting feedback which we do uh, another thing we do is uh, we use google analytics on our developer documentation so we have a website where developers can go and look up like all our documentation, like uh, definitions of the different API endpoints or like tutorials on how to configure certain things. So by running Google Analytics there, we can see like which of which uh, endpoints of our API are the most uh, popular. Uh, we can see like which search terms were the most common. And this helps us identify like what people struggle with the most because like the most people search for like how do how do referrals work or something like that kind of implies that this is like not something that is user friendly out of the box like people have to keep reaching out to us to help them configure referral use cases just as an example so that that's like a, a good indicator that work needs to be done there and a third thing we do to collect developer feedback is we analyze API logs uh, in Datadog. Now, this is like very, very technical, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail here, but basically Datadog is a tool that allows you to see what is going on behind the scenes on your server. So we can monitor the actual traffic that people are generating, that our customers are generating. And by monitoring the traffic they are generating, uh, we can make tons of analysis, like seeing, okay, which, uh, which parts of our API are the most popular, um, which are the slowest, you know, like that's also a very thing. Like if, if the tool is slow, like this is also not good. Like performance is a very important metric for us. So if we identify slowness, we need to like address that. Uh, then going on to the marketeer side, the, the first thing we try to do is, uh, like I said, you shouldn't only rely on like user interviews because it's only a certain type of user that will uh, agree to do them. But at the same time, they're still very, very valuable, of course, because you're never going to get any more direct feedback. Uh, so we try to, inter for each of our customer, we try to inter uh, determine who is the biggest power user there. Let's say a customer of ours is like a marketing department of like six, seven people that are all configuring campaigns in Talent One, or they're creating coupon codes or whatever. Um, there's always going to be like one user that uh, knows the tool best, that like has the deepest knowledge of Talent One itself within uh, our customer. Like this is usually then the go-to person within the company that people uh, go to with questions about Talent One. Like 
Uh, I'm sure most of you know Jira or have experience with Jira or similar like uh, ticketing tools. Most companies also have like one Jira expert, right? Uh, where most people go to if something like some report in Jira doesn't work or whatever. So similarly, our customers have Talent One experts. So we conduct regular interviews with these Talent One experts and ask them about like, uh, yeah, like feedback. Uh, for people that are not willing to participate in this, we try to sneak feedback questions into unrelated calls. So whenever customers reach out to us that they want to have a call with us on like whatever topic it may be, like it can be about billing, it can be about a new feature they're interested in, about something they want to change. We always try to either at the beginning or the end of the, conver of the conversation, uh, offhandedly try to reach out like, hey, how happy are you? Like, you know, uh, anything you would like to change about the product, stuff like that. And yeah, last but not least, uh, we also use Hotjar in our tool. So um, uh, we have configured Hotjar to figure out like uh, we do screen, we use the screen recordings feature and mainly the heat maps. So uh, I included a screenshot of like a Hotjar heat map. So you can see where like users click the most often. And this helps us like identify like which actions get repeated most often basically. And, and uh, like there we can uh, identify like if there's like, let's say certain usage flows in our web app that could be optimized because people keep doing the same things over and over and it requires like five or six clicks when maybe we could uh, rework the, the UX so that it can be done in two clicks or something. Uh, yes, so then I'll give you some examples of something we changed based on feedback that we collected. So on the developer side, there is our API v2, um, meaning that some complaints we got is like on the one hand, like uh, people complain there's too much noise in the API response. Like they only care about the effects. They don't, like we would return like tons of let's say side information or metadata uh, at all times. And people were like, like, why is your response so big? I just wanna see the effects that were triggered, right? Like I, I'm just interested in, should this customer get a discount? Is this coupon accepted? Um, should I award some lo loyalty points or whatever? Uh, and at the same time, the effects themselves, like the most important part of our response, they were like a bit weird, like they, they just like this, list of numbers and strings and like I included a screenshot of like our, our API v1 effect structure don't try to understand it like just to make the point that like this is just a random list of numbers and words that are meaningless without consulting the docs first and another common one is like people that want to use two coupons on one order um, we didn't know this when we built our MVP but apparently there are many companies there that, that have a use case that requires multiple coupons on one order. Um, so yeah, we try to solve this in API v2. Uh, and just as a comparison there, you see what effects look like in API v2. So there is like more, yeah, like it, it's, it's an attempt to make it more like self-explanatory because everything has like a key and a value. Uh, and then another thing we did like more for the marketeer persona is our uh, new navigation structure. So this is mainly based on like a mix of like uh, direct user feedback and analyzing hot jar data. Uh, many customers uh, more than we anticipated were using like really small screens, like let's say uh, people with like a MacBook Air, but then they have their dock maximized and stuff. So you get like very, very little vertical space on the screen. And this leads to people needing to scroll a lot and not a lot of uh, information being visible at once. Um, we also noticed that like people switch between applications in the tool all the time. So they change something in a campaign, then they switch to another application and they have to open another cam campaign and stuff like that. And this always requires you to go back to the home screen. So you couldn't switch from one application to another application directly. And also like our settings page was like, Whenever people had to change a setting, they constantly had to dig through tabs because basically first you go to the settings page and then the settings page is divided into tabs and then you have to click on these tabs. So we try to address all these things like by uh, reworking our uh, redesign a bit, uh, our navigation a bit. 
so we moved to a vertical navigation model from horizontal to like better make better use of widescreen. Um, we added an application switcher to the navigation bar and all settings tabs are directly accessible. So I can give you an idea like this is like a before screenshot of like what our tool looked like before we had uh, implemented these changes. And here is like an after screenshot where you see like there's like we can fit like the list fits more items at once. And at the same time, you can see that on the top left, there is the switcher for the applications. And the bottom left, you see that like, even though I'm not on the settings page, I can see all the sub setting, the subsections of the settings page immediately and navigate through them directly. Um, yes, so in conclusion, like I think my main takeaways here that can be useful for everybody is if you rely only on voluntary feedback, you risk missing a big part of your user base. Uh, you need to identify your most important personas and have like a different feedback gathering strategy for each of them. And uh, yeah, like use a mix of multiple tools. Like don't try to rely on only one specific thing uh, to gather, to get all your feedback or like uh, as your single source of truth to determine like what is important right now as the next thing. Yes, uh, I think that's all from my side. Uh, I hope that was understandable. And yeah, if, if someone has, if people have any questions, I'm uh, more than happy to answer them. Good, thanks, thanks Lawrence. I really like the part about uh, tuning your feedback gathering strategy based on the persona you're working with. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, also that you would use general calls with the B2B customers to sneak in uh, some product related questions. Uh, and, and indeed, I've also encountered the part that sometimes the survey respondents self-select and you get the same people who, who reply to this survey, which may not be fully a representative of the demographic uh, that you're uh, targeting. Um, so uh, people in the chat, um you are free to to set up questions um i guess uh, we'll wait a bit also from the other panelists if you have questions uh feel free to you are also participants Going once, going twice. <laughs> uh, one moment. I will also check if there's anything on uh, Facebook, and and then we can uh, look, close it up if there's there are yes. no more questions. Sure. Maybe uh, one one question from my side. Maybe also to Luke and also to Lawrence, how do you handle the GDPR stuff? Because you're recording your user behaviors on the hot jar. Yes, so we have a um, we have a big pop up, like well, not a pop up, but like a big bar on the bottom of the screen uh, when people first log in, uh, explaining okay. this, and it's like a one click opt out basically. Um, okay. At the same time. It's like a bit vague with GDPR. I mean, there's still differences between you offering like a free tool, B2C, like getting people to sign up, like, hey, it's free, but actually we're gathering your data versus these are employees of our customers using this tool during their working hours, right? Like for their work. So I think in that context, it's also like, uh, I'm obviously no GDPR expert, but Anyway, like we we talked to our lawyers and they said that like the the opt out banner we have at the bottom of the screen should be more than enough. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, we 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 get this question quite a lot on GDPR as well. Like, and I think we we had spoken as well, like um, to to a few to to the, to our German legal counsel as well, and like we we also 
we as a product we make sure that we do not collect uh, like even like we specifically state in our terms of use and the way the product is built is to more collect as Lawrence uh, highlighted like um, patterns rather than specific information about specific people um, in the case where we have specific information for specific people we have we offer the tools to sort of remove the data you know you can uh, anyone can go on our website and and, and ask us what uh, and we can tell him what data we have around him so um, Oh, so I, I checked the, the, there are no extra questions on Facebook. Okay. How does the engine exclude false positives? I'm not sure I understand that question or like what it's supposed to, what it's referring to exactly. But I, I, I'll, I'll maybe, What are the practical issues you see with the bias? Huh. That's a very good question because uh, it, it, it is a bit of a trap, especially when you do like face-to-face -face user interviews, like you tend to pay more information, uh, pay more attention. Like if, if the person you're interviewing is like very charismatic somehow, uh, you do, yeah, you sometimes catch yourself that like if, if the people are very good at wording the issues they're having and that, that, that like you, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 no, that's totally, you're totally right. Oh, yeah, 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 we should definitely improve that, you know. Um, so sometimes you can get like blinded by, uh, let's say, a very knowledgeable or, or, or charismatic end users that try to seduce you into prioritizing their uh, yeah their requests so to say so yeah that, that's definitely something you have to be wary of and that's of course also where like gathering raw data uh, is more important I, I mean it kind of like uh, protects you from that uh, yeah but I still think that a mix of both is is, is necessary to get like a full picture um, yeah, but it's something you have to watch out for to not be biased uh, towards like certain uh, users. But I think for us as a B2B, it's quite the bias. We have one area where we are allowed to be biased in that is how much does this customer pay a month, you know? And I think that's probably the same for many B2Bs. It's like uh, the, bigger, the bigger this contract is, like the more this customer spends, on you, like the likelier it is that their requests are gonna end up at the, at the top of the priority list. That's just like the um, the reality of, of, of business, I would say. Uh, there's a new question, experience, what has been the proportions of market spend of your customers? Uh, I am afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Like, um, like, I mean, the different companies have very different marketing budgets, like how much they like spend online versus offline is a bit out of scope of what we're doing because what we're offering is more like a tool, you know, it's a means to an end. It's like a toolbox that you use to achieve your promotions. Um, so for instance, yes, like uh, customers can use Talent One to create a, a campaign that contains like a million coupon codes and every single coupon code gives like a thousand euro discount. Like, and you have potentially like a, a billion in discounts uh, outstanding. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like the, the, the spend on the promotion engine is not really part, for most of our customers, it's not part of their marketing budget. Like it's part of their IT budget, which I think is unfair because it, if, if you look at the cost or the spend on this promotion engine, uh, in the scope of your marketing budget, it's like peanuts uh, for many customers because like I think 
most companies have a way bigger marketing budget than an IT budget, at least in, in, the, in the business we are working in, like uh, web shops and stuff like that. I don't know if that really answers the question, but yeah, that, that's like my, what I had to share on that topic. Uh, how do you overcome this? Um, that's for the sales department. Like that's more like a sales question than a product question, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it, that, that's also, I mean, the alternative to using Talent One for most customers is that they would have to build something in-house um because we don't really have like clear competitors that that like do exactly the same as we do i think i mean there's like one or two exceptions but they they target like they're like either only focusing on coupons or vouchers or only focusing on loyalty programs or stuff like that um so for most of our customers it's build or buy you know it's either they buy talent one or they build something themselves and especially with like bigger enterprise customers building themselves basically means hiring some agency or like uh, hiring some freelancers to build it for them uh, and this gets like very expensive very fast uh, especially because you have an ongoing server cost so for those type of customers i would say that uh, even if they look only at their it budget the 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 cost is 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 easily justified of course if you compare it to um, if all you care about is having like a very simple coupon solution uh, where let's say, yeah, we just want to be able to create coupons and each coupon should get either a fixed a discount amount or a percentage on the total. And we don't care about any other things like this is more than enough for us. This covers all of our promotion needs. Yeah, then of course, building it yourself is more is cheaper than, than, than buying uh, talent one let's say uh yeah but i, I i'm sure our, our sales people have many more tricks up their sleeves to convince uh potential customers that like uh, talent one is a, a worthwhile investment cool thank you for answering Okay, so you can mark the last questions as answered. And uh, thank you for your time. You're welcome. And uh, coming up uh, next is Butra, who is originally from Berlin and now living in uh, Switzerland, uh, as, as she likes to say it. Um, she will be talking about her experience at uh, Doodle. Uh, over to you, Butra. Yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I had to switch my headphones. Can you still hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. So never forget when you're going on an online meetup, uh, don't forget to charge your headphones. Um, lesson learned. Um, and I will also stick with this nice background. We're just playing with the backgrounds because if I don't, then you'll see uh, this in my background. And I think we're, we have enough about, we've talked enough about work and work in home office is like, okay, you know, we have to stop somewhere. So I'll, I'll stick to that one. I will just pretend I was um, on an island like Malta and uh, be uh, surrounded by an IC like, like uh, Luke is. I'm not, I'm in, in Zurich and I'm not at the lake. So I have like building blocks around me. Um, all right, thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's really a nice opportunity um, to be here. Let me just share my screen and um, start away. Do you see my screen with data question mark, question mark? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, so data. Mm. Data um, in the context of product management is actually um, a controversial one. one. So it, it seems like we're, we in this call are all clear about um, the importance of data, but it's even for product managers or among product managers, it's actually a bit controversial. So there is different types of, of, of understandings and different types of people. And I just want to make sure what type of an understanding of data I have and what type of a person I am. So there is this type of people who live and breathe data. They are data, like whatever 
whatever you do, whatever or whatever they do, whatever they decide, they always base it on data. They love to score everything, you know, just quantify it no matter what, and then just follow the score. It's going to be right. Forget about any other signals around you. Data is king. Data is everything. I'm not that kind of a person. Then there's people who think data is a myth. So all you need to build amazing products is, you know, your imagination, your feelings, your opinions, and that's it. You don't need nothing else. Just go blind um, and yeah, you don't need data at all. I'm not that kind of a person either. And then there's people who think data is a really nice uh, objective source of information and is equal to any other kind of or so, uh, source of information. And they use this, 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 this mix of information to make decisions, um, like balanced decisions, considering different, um, different input. They use data to align teams. They use data to you know, be on the same page with everybody. However, they also leave some space for, for experience and instinct. And that's me. So that's me. Um, again, hello. Um, I'm Bishra Joshkunar. Don't try to uh, pronounce my last name. Just don't do it. Um, I'm, I've actually spent my whole career in product management um, since I've uh, finished my um, studies, actually even before I finished my studies. And I've worked in very different companies of different sizes and different industries. And also on products of like in different stages of a product's life cycle. However, my passion, and therefore I, I'd like to say my, special, my, my specialty or my specialization is in early stage products. And now there's this thing with early stage products. Um, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an idea of what's the right thing to build. And um, no matter in which, um, level of the organization you are working, if you're on the very strategic level as a CPO, VP of product, whatever, or more on the mid-level like the product group leader, a head of product, or more on the you know tactical level, the product manager or the product owner on the tactical level, it doesn't matter. Everybody has ideas and everybody um, you know thinks their idea is the best thing and we should go with that one as next. At the same time, data is also everywhere. And data is also important everywhere. Like OKRs um, are uh, a hot thing. Um, the North Star metric is the next hot thing. And there's like other um, types of metrics and frameworks that um, people like to follow. And this is also important. So you see, we have those two things. Now, how do we bring those two things together to make good decisions? And that's what, what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's um, evidence-based idea management. And I will share you uh, share with you how I uh, like to decide on whether to reject an idea, to build it, or to experiment. And then I will also have uh, like three examples uh, from my time um, at, at Doodle that I will share with you to give you ideas on, on what type of ideas can actually um, or can we actually talk about, right? Like, because there's things that I personally never imagined that this could be an idea that we need to back up. Um, so again, you get lots of ideas and Luke also mentioned what we are trying to do is we try to work on, um, or we try to find the next uh, value adding uh, item, right? We try to find the next value adding um, idea. Um, however, it's not always that easy, right? I mean. Remember the last conversation with a colleague from sales. We need this feature. We need that feature. We, we really need that because all of our customers have asked for it and the competitors have it too. Maybe that's right. Maybe it's not. But that's a thing. That's an opinion, right? So this, our colleague comes to us with an opinion. Um, it's okay to have this opinion. Um, Sorry, what's happening? Okay, it's okay to have this opinion, um, but it's just this person's opinion. Another person have has maybe an other uh, different opinion on that, or we have uh, we're gone. We go through our feedback um, 
maybe we have used um, uh, Lawrence like tele, um, Talon One uh, solution. Now we have like picked some feedback and we think like, okay, now everybody's looking for item, whatever, right? Like feature X, Y, Z. Um, but that's another opinion, maybe. Maybe it's not, maybe it's data. How do we know? Um, and I really like um, James uh, Barksdale's uh, quote here. If we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. And if we don't have data, we will end up being in meetings where everybody will talk about their opinions. And you know, the person who shouts, shouts their opinion the loudest will probably win. And it's probably going to be your manager as we know that. So therefore, what can we do with all the ideas that are coming up? What can we do with that? So um, evidence is the magic word here. What you need to ask for is evidence. Anybody can come, come up with an idea. You have millions of ideas. You, know, you, can, you can just uh, build your next idea. Why not? But you need evidence. When you talk with your colleague from sales, you need to ask your colleague um, for business value and for customer value. So, you know, things like um, how many companies have really asked for this feature? Um, what's the deal size? Where are we in the sales funnel, you know, with this customer? How uh, big is the chance that we will get this deal when we build this feature? How many users do those customers have that ask for this feature? You need to ask for evidence. Um, so how do you get evidence? Luke mentioned it in, in his pr presentation and um, Lawrence basically mentioned it as well. You need to get data. So you have data that serves you as evidence that supports idea X or Y or Z. So how does it look like? So imagine you have your, your, your list of ideas. Um, you have your list of ideas and um, what you can do is, I mean, the first thing that you do is you basically uh, use your preferred prioritization method you know, to score it. It doesn't matter what kind of prioritization technique it is in the end, any kind of prioritization technique is a sort of a uh, decision matrix. Um, you can do, cost benefit analysis as, as Luke likes, um, you know, we like to look at return on investments. You can build a whole business case, that's fine. But you need to ask yourself or the person that gives you this business case or the scoring, one key, key question. The question that you need to ask is, how confident are you that your assumptions are correct? Even business cases in the first place, are based on assumptions. You do a lot of assumptions to build a business case. And you have even more assumptions when you do a simple scoring. And within this question, there is there, there lies another question, which is the second one here. How confident are you that your potential customers really want that feature or product? How confident are you? And here we see the connection with data and evidence. So you need data that serves as evidence. So like to support your ideas so that you can be confident that this idea can be really the next value adding item. So this is a set of my preferred um, prioritization techniques. And as you can see, almost all of them contain the uh, aspect of, um, of confidence already um, in itself, except the pi one. So um, I typically like to add something else uh, to the normal uh, prioritization techniques for the pi. I typically add urgency and confidence. So I'm also then asking for confidence level if pi is the only thing that I'm, that I'm using. So typically I'm, I'm actually connecting it and, I'm, and I will show you in a second how I do that. Um, so, but when we talk about confidence, how should you score confidence? And you will see, I'm a huge fan of Itamar Gilad's um, confidence um, meter, and I typically use this scale. You can Google, you, you can Google it, uh, you can Google for confidence Itamar Gilad, or you can just go on the page as um, shown um, down here. 
and uh, you will find the confidence meter there. And I really like to use that because it, there's like a couple of things that become very clear in this. Only because somebody has an opinion, it doesn't mean that it that it's you know evidence. An an opinion is not evidence. It's the same with back of the envelope calculations. Fine that you do that, nice, but that's still you know, it can still go very, very wrong. So what does that mean? It means if you want to really be confident about your assumptions, you need to go on the real side of the world. You need to go to reality side of the world. Basically, what that means is you need to get market data. You need to, you know, get real user customer evidence by, by, trying things out and by talking to your potential customers, you need to test. And the, the, the highest way of, of um, confidence or the highest level of confidence is only once you launch, you know, what, what's gonna happen. So this um, um, scale really encourages everybody to bring out the solution as fast as possible. The, the minimum um, way of how you can solve a problem as, as soon as possible to, you know, get real market input on that. So how does it look like in practice? Uh, we can start to look at um, this impact uh, uncertainty metrics just to get into the thinking of it, you know, like how do you need, um, what do you need confidence or evidence for? Um, and you can start of thinking like if you are um, quite certain so if your uncertainty level is low that means your your confidence level is quite high that the impact of um, the idea that you're looking at is low then of course you're, you're going to reject it if you're quite sure that's going to be high of course you're going to uh, you're going to build it however if you are highly uncertain about the impact of a feature of an idea sorry then you need to run a test. You need to run a test to understand if the impact is really high or not. But that there's one thing missing here. It's the investment part, right? Uh, return on investment. We are always looking on, on return on investment in some uh, way or another. Therefore, um, I like to use um, the ICE score when it's in uh, B2C and the RICE score when it's in B2B. The logic is kind of the same uh, with impact and confidence. However, we have another aspect here, right? So basically, sometimes it doesn't change anything and sometimes it changes everything. So for example, if, if, um, if uh, or as long as you're not quite confident if the impact is high or no, um, or, or high or low, then, then it doesn't matter how easy it is to build it you should first experiment before you actually um, try to build a whole solution. On the other hand, it doesn't matter um, if the, the um, solution is really, really easy to build as long as you're pretty confident. Yes, three means pretty confident. If we look at the scale, it's kind of not bad. If you're pretty confident that the impact is quite low, then even if it's easy to build, why should you, why should you, um, you know, spend resources on building something that has no impact? You know, and um, let's say you have found an idea that you're highly confident that it's going to have a huge impact, but it's really difficult to, uh, to, to build. Then you should think about it if you really want to build that solution the way it is, or maybe you should go back to, to the drawing board and ideate one more time to find um, a smaller solution to the same problem that you're trying to solve. Remember, every idea is actually a solution to a problem. So maybe there's a different solution that you that you want to think about. And if you're like kind of meh for, for, for all of those three, then it might also be good to, to run an experiment to actually see what the impact really is. Um, and then maybe also to ideate on um, the solution itself. It's kind of that um, um, mindset of how to uh, decide if you want to run an experiment or reject or build. Once you've decided that you want to run an experiment, 
Then in the next step, so this is what I like to do is then I, I like to collect all the hypotheses around that idea and around that experiment. Again, any idea um, is just a solution to a problem. So maybe there is other ideas and other hypotheses to solve the same problem. And therefore I start ideating um, on, on different other hypotheses around this, this idea. And then I like to use um, or apply the pi scoring and add the urgency to decide if I want to really run an experiment for that hypothesis, hypothesis yes or no. Once I did that, once I um, ran a test, then I go back to that scoring and if needed, I adjust the impact score and I definitely adjust the confidence score and then I reevaluate. So item number one and five would be then reevaluated and then I would decide if I want to build it or if, if I will reject the idea. Um, I hope this is clear so far. If not, here's a screenshot of um, the, yeah, I'm, an, I'm a spreadsheet monster, the same way as I'm a tap monster, I'm a spreadsheet monster. So um, this is a, um, a screenshot of um, Airtable, the smart uh, spreadsheet. No, I'm not taking any commission for that, but I love that tool. Um, can highly recommend, check it out. Um, so basically we have the list of our ideas. We have, we always want to understand the problem behind that. And we have also um, uh, put down the, the key results that um, are affected in the first place by this idea and other outcomes as well. There might, there might be other outcomes that uh, move um, with this idea. Why is that important? It's important because prioritization is not only a matter of scoring, right? So again, in the beginning, I mentioned those people who say score says everything. No score, the score doesn't say everything. Because if the idea is, is about to, to solve a, a uh, problem that is not connected to a key R, um, in our, uh, that uh, we committed to in this quarter, then we simply don't look at this idea. It's not the right time for it, um, but we will consider it when we look at, um, at key results or at outcomes um, that we commit to in a different quarter. So that's a screenshot of our idea bank, and that's a screenshot of um, our hypothesis list um, again, we have different types of other input, and then we have uh, the scoring in the uh, in the end to decide which hypothesis we want to test and uh, which not. So, as promised, here um, three examples from my time at Doodle. Um, the first one is something that I person um, I personally also um, could not think about that this could be a thing that we should um, uh, experiment with. Um, and just to, to um, guide you through, this is um, also from Itamar Gilad. Um, it's his after framework, assessment, fact finding, tests, experiments, and, and then it, uh, there comes a release. Um, and I will guide you through a bit of, uh, on, on these steps where these um, ideas, uh, where you can put or locate these ideas in this framework. So the first one is naming a new solution, which is in the fact finding part. So basically, um, uh, in uh, so at Doodle, I was leading the product area for uh, building new business scheduling solutions. And one of that was a um, calendar that would show you your availabilities and people could uh, book a time with you uh, for a one-on-one. -on -one. We built this um, solution and then we needed a name. And we already experienced that it's really bad that, uh, to change the name once you've launched. So how should we name um, the new solution? What we did was we collected lots of ideas from, from anyone. Again, here we are with ideas, right? Ideas are everywhere and it doesn't matter what topic it is, everybody has an idea. So we collected ideas on names internally in the company as well as from, from our beta users. Um, and then we ran a test on Usability Hub. We um, made different um, combinations of different names that we've collected. So we did a pre-filtering uh, um, of, of the names. And then we, yeah, kind of did different uh, combinations of those names. And then we asked, 
three questions. What do you think one-on-one -on -one meeting in this, in, in this example, one-on-one -on -one meeting option will create? What do you think booking calendar option will create? What do you think group meeting option will create? And then we analyzed um, the answers um, to see how right the people were and how wrong the people were with guessing what the option does compared to what the option really does. And then we had a clear winner, winner and it is bookable calendar. And now Doodle has a, a tool, a feature, a sub product, however you want to call it, that's called bookable calendar that you can find on uh, the dashboard when you log in because it, it, it won in all the three categories, most right, most right and partial and least wrong. So that you, you can see this is where data comes in to, to, to serve as evidence um, that, the, that the idea, the name bookable calendar is a good name for this new feature so that we're quite confident to launch the feature with the name bookable calendar. So this is the connection. Another example is deciding on a feature. It's a kind of a typical one. Um, so it's in this test area. And it was about a building a preview feature for the bookable calendars, which was um, a quite yeah, difficult one to build. So we did a simple thing. We faked or tested it. So we add this, uh, we added this, this uh, button saying, email me a preview. And the only thing that the, this button would do would it would um, open this overlay saying, saying sorry and thank you at the same time. Um, and then we, we, we uh, counted the clicks on this button. And voila, more than one third of people who were on this page clicked on the button. Then we went back to our users um, and then collected some more input around that because it was really a big feature, like technically uh, on, uh, during that time, it was a quite a big feature. So we went back to the, the uh, users and asked for more input. And the first thing that we did was we tried to find the smallest solution to this problem and basically um, enabled them to send themselves an email, what, which was not possible until then. And then in a second um, step only, we uh, build the full preview feature. The third and the last example is actually an, an example for instinct. And that's why I believe um, scores and numbers cannot always um, be the only answer to guide us. Sometimes we really need some space for instinct and experience. We were wondering why people would be um, rather sharing, um, you know, copying the link and share it like you would do with, with um, Doodle polls anyway, rather than inviting um, others to um, the bookable calendar via email, like within the tool itself. We went through our feedback. So we have, uh, we, uh, we, we, we had a, um, structured feedback collection process. And then we went through the feedback and saw this little uh, friend here uh, down on that list, add personal message. And we thought like, hey, why not? It's a very easy feature to build. It's nice to have anyway. And maybe this could be um, the answer to our, to our question, um, why uh, people uh, are not uh, inviting others via email. And we build it in. And boom, it worked. It worked, it um, increased the ratio of people sharing um, the bookable calendar link via email um, compared to sharing them um, just with the link itself. So that was a success based on instinct because you know we made we we connected the dots. Well, yeah, so data um, again, it's data is important, it's a very important source for information um, because data, qualitative as well as quantitative data, um, serves as evidence for supporting ideas and makes us confident to release idea X or Y or Z. It's not a proof. So that's, that's uh, there is a difference between evidence and proof. We can only have proof once we really launched it and see actual usage in its actual environment. Until then, it can only be evidence. However, this is already quite good to increase our confidence level 
So, you know, when we go the next time in a meeting and talk about ideas, we don't talk about opinions anymore and rather about data. And, you know, we basically rule the meeting and uh, everything goes well for us, hopefully. Um, and then once we've decided for the idea, actually the next steps are clear and here it, uh, data uh, again plays a role in it. We build it, we measure it and we learn it. Um, and that's all I have to say about data. Thanks um, a lot. And if you want to get in touch with me, you know, exchanging on anything product and on anything data, feel free, um, feel free to get in touch over whichever channel uh, you want. LinkedIn is probably the easiest, but yeah, as you wish. Thanks a lot. Really like that ending with the cool glasses. <laughs> Thank you. A really good move. And also that part that if we're going by opinions, let's take mine. <laughs> yeah, that's typically what I say when I talk with people um, who cannot immediately bring, you know, some evidence. Okay, let's talk about my opinion, I think. And then I just continue and they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> you know, so it, that works. That's really cool. And how, how do you pull this off as an external consultant? Because it's, it's easier when you're with a team and, and you're like, everyone knows you and there's like a different type of intimacy. Uh, but when you are with a client, it's slightly more tricky. It is slightly more tricky. Um, so I have a superpower. That's one. That's something that one of my clients said. Actually, um, he said I have a superpower to ask the right annoying questions. So I think this is how you how you can how you can deal with it. You ask the right annoying questions about you know actually uh, what what Luke also mentioned um, about why should we actually uh, do this? Why should we go with this idea and not with that idea? Um, and then you know they start to typically to talk about opinions and um, then I'm like, okay, but what do users say? What do customers say? Do we really know that? And then typically they're like, well, our salespeople say that, or well, I've heard whatever. And, and like recently um, it was like, oh yeah, latest uh, feature request by our, by our clients is this and that. And I'm like, okay, how many clients did ask for that? And he was like, one <laughs> and this way you're like you know okay so maybe we should we should see if other clients want the same you know and when you ask the right annoying questions they actually come up with the answers themselves that's really cool uh, by the way attendees if if you like to ask questions go ahead uh don't mind us chatting or also I, I... lawrence yeah, no, I, I just want to say that I really like that at the very end there, uh, you mentioned that there should be still some space left for instinct. Uh, because as much as we've been spending like uh, over two hours now talking about data driven product management, uh, and as important as it is, of course, to gather all this data and collect all this feedback and whatnot, in the end, it's our instinct that makes product management a bit of an art form you know otherwise it's just basically monkey work <laughs> monkey work yes number <laughs> yeah. crunching and whatnot i mean i i always like this this uh quote from henry ford you know who basically invented the modern car uh if i would just do what my customers ask i should build faster horses um and i think that that that's like something to keep in mind when gathering all this user feedback it's that like maybe like maybe at the end of the day this one crazy idea you have is the best solution in the end or should be the highest priority even though because i think also what's very important when gathering user feedback it's that users will communicate their problems in the form of a solution they already have in mind themselves so they'll say, hey, can you please build me this, you know, or they'll say like, hey, I think you should add this feature. Then the most important thing you should do at that point in time is ask, okay, why are you asking for this feature? Because they're asking for that feature because of a problem they're having. 
And the problem they're having is more important than the solution they're suggestion, suggesting because it's up to you as a product manager to come up with the best possible solution for their product. And it's not always easy to filter this out. Like it, uh, I catch myself still from time to time, like when customers ask for something to instinctively say, ah, yeah, 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 that makes sense. But then often you have to take a step back and try to see the bigger picture, you know, uh, like what is the oh, real really. issue here? Totally agree. And when we were collecting feedback, so I mentioned we had a structured feedback collection uh, process. And we, when we gathered feedback, the very interesting part of it is when um, multiple people ask for the same feature. So they mention that feature. And this is a this is a nice point when you can actually start to see a pattern. So you get aware that there is a problem. Somewhere in this process is a problem so that everybody, oh, that so many people uh, uh, people, so many users are actually asking for a very specific feature. And this is also a very nice uh, piece of information. However, if you try to quantify everything, you will miss this kind of opportunities. So if you quant try to quantify everything, you will miss those, um, you know, opportunities that you discover while you're actually talking to 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 those users especially when you uh, when you're in the early stage of building a product that's very important you need to be so close to your users so close to your customers um quantifying everything doesn't doesn't get you anywhere you don't have enough customers to actually quantify everything so therefore you need to be a bit more creative you know about how you actually want to get your evidence so this is this is even another challenge of that yeah yeah i think you could almost go as far as to say that like product management in like a, let's say a startup phase or an mvp phase of like a brand new thing is almost a completely different discipline from like working on like an established product with like uh, hundreds of thousands of users and dozens of stakeholders because that's also the thing right like it's not Definitely. just the users it's also an entire business around it like with with, uh, with different types of stakeholders whereas like if if you're building an mvp it's just you on your own almost exactly and, and yeah it, it, it's it's actually a very different skill set i i yeah. would say even though like that the job description is the same uh, yeah. yeah which is also actually very very interesting i mean um there is it. I, I believe, depending on the stage of the life cycle that the product is in, and therefore the the adopter group that the product tries to address, you need a different type of product manager actually. And this is like still like, however, that's my how, however moment. However, in any kind of phase of um, the product life cycle, you still need to find ways to get evidence and. It doesn't make it easy all the time, right? You can, you can also fool yourself with with data. That's another part, or that's another reason why I believe being data informed, or let's say why I prefer to be data informed rather than data driven. You, know, you can there is like millions of ways you can get the data wrong, like you know understand it in a wrong way or gather it in a wrong way. Oh, oops, somebody forgot to add this tracking event to Google Analytics. We're blind on that spot. Oh, you know, <laughs> happens all, all the time. And classic. therefore, totally classic. And therefore, uh, yeah, I think being data, like seeing data as source of information is, um, for me at least, um, more reasonable than to let yourself drive by scores. And to build up on that, it's also harder than when you are in an established company. And if the numbers don't point up when you're running an experiment or you're trying to something slightly different, then you're in a bit of trouble. Whereas when you're starting out, you don't have reputation or customers or most of anything to lose. So then you can change around very fast. You can be a bit more scrappy and experiment. And of course, uh, like you guys said, it, it takes a different skill set and different way of operating uh, at these stages. I'm not quite sure if I agree with that. Um, I think it depends on whether you have money or not. If, if not, if you're a real startup, then actually 
um, I personally feel like that's that's my personal feel. I feel more pressure to get the things right than when you're actually an established company and have money. Um, and I think there's the I think money makes a huge difference if you have money or not, you know. Um, because as a startup, you need to find the M like a good problem solution fit as fast as possible but you don't have so much data to work with you don't have so much evidence to work with so there is a lot of instinct and gut feeling in there and i believe that startups who think that um, they can build a startup based on data like purely on data with no gut feeling they, they trick themselves that that's simply not possible you have lots oh, of, of qualitative course. data yes but not quantitative data you don't have that I mean, I guess the thing is, though, I mean, usually like a startup, I mean, any startup that has a right to exist starts based on an idea. And this idea probably comes from data that was gathered beforehand, either in like previous work experience or, uh, yeah, whatever, through market research or, or, or it doesn't matter. But somehow, yes, once you start building your MVP, you're a bit blind in terms of the actual details of the implementation. But usually there is some data still there somewhere in the background that, that yeah. led to this startup coming into existence. I mean, we saw the confidence meter by Itamar Gillard, right? Yeah. So only because you have you have an idea doesn't mean it's, it's going to be a good idea. But as soon as you get more to the market data level, you tend to get into the ones and threes of, of, of the scale, right? So this is this is the level where a startup should have actually done their homework very well. Um, and as you say, should already have some, some signal, um, you know, to actually have a reason why to build the startup. So I completely agree. And I believe, um, you know, Doodle is a, is a tool that everybody's using, right? Like, every, like it has millions of, of, of um, active users uh, per month. So when you try to uh, improve the Doodle polls, you have lots of data and you can do really crazy stuff crazy things and really cool things you know like you can a b test almost everything and this is pretty cool um but when you build a new product for a product that exists for quite some time you still start from scratch and uh, things are different totally different um i think we uh, when i i think i re can really relate to what to what you guys are saying like the the difference between you know, being in a startup and like in a more established company. And so I, I joined Hoja at the time, it was just coming out of the of the startup phase. And I, I really saw the, obviously as as um, uh, as Lauren said, the, it was data driven, maybe more qualitative data driven um, at the start. And that is where vision of the founders, the vision, you know, is, is really, um, uh, is really important because at that stage you know you need to if there's something that's working you need to, you need a very strong direction otherwise if you try, start going in different directions you know based off let's say like small data points here and there it, 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 there is a damage that you take the product in a, in, in a completely different direction and that you have misalignment in your team so yeah, yeah. Totally. and um yep that so definitely like two two set completely agree two two different completely um, mindsets. And it's hard to say where the tipping point lies, you know, like because it's like one day you realize that your job changed, like and hey, oh, I'm I'm still product manager, but like what I'm doing every day is like nothing like what I did a year and a half ago. Like what happened in between? It's like. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, how in, in, you've been at Hotjar for two years? Like, how many uh, employee? Like, from how many to how many employees did they go in that time? So I was, I think, number f close to fifty, either just below or just above. But and now mm -hmm. we we've gone over a hundred, so it's doubled in size, and I can already feel the difference. There was a point yeah. where we were sort of that that point um, where. It was when I joined, 
where it seemed like, um, you know, people before I joined there was a lot of um, people working off of, of, of gut feel and uh, not gut feel you know but more vision aligned with the vision mm-hmm. of the founders they had a really strong vision there um, and there was a point where things did slow down because th- that transitioning the transition was actually happening and I say that because uh, with hindsight, right? Not not because at the mm-hmm. time I, I knew that it was happening, but you could feel that there was this change happening, like uh, the, the change in the way the way you have you know to do things. Also, um, I, I think the the I don't know. If, there's the adoption life cycle of any of any product, right? From from you start off with the innovators with the very first. Um, few customers as as that grows like the 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 requirements of the customers they also change they need more um they 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 need more complete solutions customers need more complete solutions as as they're adopted and as you reach more conservative customers as that grows so all all of this feeds uh, and i think you you um uh, you also touched on this earlier lawrence is you need to you need to cater like for the time and for the customers you're tackling at the time the, yeah and <laughs> and how you're gathering data and and yeah and I, but i think one one really really important thing which I'll, i i'll just double down on and that's it i'll stop blabbering um is to is to make sure that we use data to find the opportunities like um even when we have a lot of data there is a trap Especially like if you as you're growing bigger, bigger, um, the I call it the experimentation trap, where you just have one area and you just start firing. Uh, there is a metric, and you just start firing ideas left, right, and center. They're not aligned with a vision or anything. Just to anything to push the, those numbers, and it's a trap. You end up like in a local maxima where you're trying to optimize something that you know. If you take a step back and really look at the problem, you can find something that's even higher. Agree. Okay, yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, then I think we we can wrap it up now. Thank you so much for mm-hmm. your time. Look now, I'm just noticing we have the same wardrobes in the back of our screens. <laughs> It's actually a, it's yeah I'll I'll um uh, I'll tell you afterwards. It's, it's basically like there are um uh, these strings hanging from one. Ah, there's one oh, okay. the other. shadow. Sorry. It's, it's, it's shadow, just yeah. a shadow. <laughs> All right, I, I thought that those were wardrobe doors because no. it, it looks very similar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Then uh, thank you all so much for your time. Um, and I hope to meet you in person one day. Uh, maybe we even host at the uh, Talon one once this is over. Yes, uh, you, you've been at our office before, right? Or, no, um, oh, it, okay. the, the curfew was just imposed at our previous meetup. So we switched ah, right, spontaneously right. Uh, online. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, by the time, like, it's funny, like, uh, we actually we were just about to move to the brand new office when the uh, quarantine started. So we have like a brand new office ready to be used, but like literally the Monday we were gonna move was the Monday that the government said like, okay, everyone has to work from home. So uh, yeah, it's just been sitting there (laughs) waiting for us, waiting to have meetups and stuff, but yeah. (laughs) Sweet. Let's hope. All right, we're very (laughs) happy to to help uh, have meetups there. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Cool. cool. Then uh, Bushra, Lawrence, Luke, and Anil, and the four people still left online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much uh-huh. for your time and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.